Hello, when you see me, you know it's time for music, right? So, I've decided to take you on a journey with me, okay? And it's all about music and the history of music. What did Mrs. Toy say now? The what? The history of music. Now, what is history? If you're not sure, quickly pause the video and make sure mom and dad explains to you or Omar or brother what history means. Now you know what it is, right? History is everything that happened in the past. So we are in April now, so what happened in March is history. What happened 100 years ago is history. So we're going to start our history journey in 1660. Okay. All the way from there, right up to here. So what I have here, I wrote there. If I get my papers the correct way. Come on, Mrs. De Toy. It says there, history of music. From 1600 to 17. 1950, we call that time period or era the Baroque era. Can you quickly say this with me? Baroque? Say one more time. Baroque. Then after that, from 1750 to round about 1820, was the classical period. Can you say Classical, can you say that again for me? Right, classical period. After that, we go on to 1820 to round about 1890, the Romantic period. Say for me, Romantic period. Just say that again for me. That's better. Then, after that, 1890 to 1930, and 1930, my mother was actually born. So you can work out after the video how old my mommy is now, if she was born in 1930. Was the early modern period, and from there on up to where we are now, we call the Postmodern era. Now, here in the postmodern era, we listen to Beyonce and Miley Cyrus and all those people, and the rap music of P. Diddy and Lil Wayne. I think that is what you guys call it. But I'm going a little bit to the back than that. Now, in 1600, in 1666, I'm going to take you to a city in Britain called London. Now, London had something terrible happen to them in 1666. And if you continue watching this video, you will hear the story of what happened in London at that time. But what is beautiful about London is there's a river and the river is called the River Thames. Can you say that for me? Say it again. The River Thames flows through London. And let's quickly learn a song about the River Thames. Of old River Thames, forwards and 
sideways and backwards and then rowboats and sailboats again and again Ferry boatmen, rowboats and sailboats again and again. Flow, 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 flow. Now that you've learned that song. In London, there's also a street called Pudding Lane. And I'm going to let you learn a song about Pudding Lane because this disaster happening that happened in 1666 started in Pudding Lane. So now let's quickly learn the song of Pudding Lane. Loaves of bread, watch them rise, heat them up with puddings and pies, make and bake pastry cakes, loaves of bread and puddings and pies. Loaves of bread, watch them rise, eat them up with puddings and pies, make and bake pastry cakes, loaves of bread and puddings and pies. Now that you know that song, I'm ready for you to listen to the story of what happened in London in 1666. It was called the Great Fire of London. Listen carefully, right? He's, co he's coming from the bakers. He's from the bakery. There's a fire at the bakery. It's a, it's, there's a fire at the bakers! Everybody! There's a fire coming out of the bakers! It's spreading! It's spreading from the bakery! Get outside! Get yourself some buckets! It's, it's the whole of Pudding Lane! It's all on fire! 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 Just after midnight on Sunday the 2nd of September 1666, a fire began in a bakery on a London street called Pudding Lane. By the time it was put out, four days later, over 13,000 houses, nearly 100 churches and many important buildings had burnt down. And around 100,000 people had been made homeless. We call it the Great Fire of London. In those days, houses were mostly made of timber and had thatched roofs which caught fire easily. People had candles to see by and cooked food in ovens heated by an open fire. You only had to drop your candle or forget to put out the fire for the whole house to catch fire too. And as most houses were built closely together in narrow streets, fire could spread quickly from house to house and from street to street. That's what happened that night in the bakery in Pudding Lane. It belonged to Thomas Farriner, the king's baker, which was an important job. Each night, as Thomas went to bed, he made sure that no candle was left burning in the bakery and that the fire was put out too. <sighs> oh, that time already? 
Oh, what a busy day it's been. Right, just tidy away these sacks of flour. Make sure all the candles are out. And the fire in the oven too, of course. All done. And off to bed. But that night, Thomas must have been too sleepy to check the fire properly. Because after he'd gone to bed, a spark, or a burning ember, must have flown out of the fire and landed on the floor. And soon, the whole kitchen was alight. In a wooden house like that, fire could spread very quickly. Flames leapt through the ground floor rooms and up the stairs, until at last the smell of smoke and the crackle of flames woke Thomas in his bedroom. What's that? Smoke? There must be a fire in the bakery. I'll go and see. Ah! Ah, wake up, everyone! Wake up! Children! The bakery's on fire! Quickly! Quickly! There's no time to lose! We'll have to escape out of the window! So Thomas and his family crawled out of the window and onto the roof, and from there, in through a window, into a neighbour's house. But by now, the fire had started to spread from Thomas's house to the next one. And then the wind blew it to the next, and the next. Everyone in Pudding Lane was wide awake by now. Still in their night clothes, they threw buckets of water over the flames and rushed in and out of their houses, trying to save what possessions they could from the fire. There's many bodies down on the street now! But it was no use. The fire kept on burning. Thick black smoke made people cough and choke. In 1666, there wasn't a proper fire service with trained firefighters. They did have some firefighting equipment, of a sort, and it was usually kept in the local church. We need fire hooks. Somebody get the fire hooks. Where get are to the church. Where? They're in the church. Get to the church. I'll go and get them. Tell them we need the fire hooks. Get the squirts as well. Bring those and get those fire hooks. There were long poles with hooks on the end called fire hooks to help pull down burning roofs and things called squirts, which squirted water onto the flames. A bit like a very large water pistol and about as much use. There were some fire engines too. Again, nothing like the ones we know today. They were like big wooden barrels that could be filled with water. And the water could be pumped onto the flames. Come on! Pump faster! Faster! It's no use! We're running out of water! It's not working! When all else failed, whole houses could be pulled down to make a fire break, which was a gap that the fire couldn't jump across. But no houses could be pulled down without first getting permission from the mayor. And when people went to him with the news of the fire, he wasn't pleased to be woken up. Sir, sir, wake up. <sighs> wake up, sir. <sighs> um, Pudding Lane is on fire. <gasps> fire? Pudding Lane? Can't the people who live there put it out by themselves? No, sir, they say they can't. They say houses will need to be pulled down to make fire bricks. They need you to give the order. Oh, I can't do that. What about the people living in those houses? And what about the cost? No, no, let me get my sleep. I'm sure the fire will be out by morning. But, sir... But the fire wasn't over by morning. Within a few hours, Pudding Lane had burned to the ground. And it didn't stop there. No matter what anyone did, the fire just got bigger and hotter. For weeks before, the weather had been very warm and dry, and the fire just gobbled up all the dry timber and thatch like a hungry dragon. By the time it was daylight that Sunday morning, the fire had reached London Bridge and the River Thames. We need to get out. Wait, the children, don't scare them. Wait, the, bring them downstairs. Get the blankets, get them, bring the candlesticks. Get as much as you can in that bag. Bring it now. Bring it now, come on. 
Sunday, 2nd of September, 1666. On the night the fire began, Londoners were woken by church bells ringing. It meant there was a fire in the city. Some people didn't worry. There were often fires in the city. They went back to sleep. Others got up to have a look and packed their belongings in case the fire should reach them. On Sunday morning, a man called Samuel Pepys hurried to the Tower of London. We know this because Pepys kept a diary and wrote about the events of the fire. He knew he'd get a good view of the burning city from the tower. Was it really as bad as he'd been told? 300 houses burnt to cinders? Could that be true? What he saw made him tremble. Some of the houses on London Bridge were on fire. London Bridge wasn't just a river crossing then, but home to lots of people. Pepys was very upset. Some of his friends lived on the bridge. What a terrible sight. Houses burning on the bridge. I pray my friends are safe. People rushing in and out of their burning houses, throwing their possessions into the river below, calling to the boatmen on the river to rescue them. Help! Help! Over here, boatmen! Over here! Heap saw that the fire was spreading along the waterfront too. There were warehouses on the banks of the River Thames, and Peeps knew they were full of things that burnt easily, like coal, timber and tar. He knew something had to be done urgently. No time to lose. I must tell the king before those warehouses blow up and the whole city burns down too. No one seems to be trying to put out the fire. They're too busy saving their things. Someone must take charge. So Peeps went to see the king. King Charles II and told him what he'd seen. Your Majesty, the fire is spreading far and wide. I have seen it with my own eyes. What can we do to stop it? We must pull down houses in the path of the fire. That will make a break that it won't be able to cross. And then that's what we will do. Find the mayor, tell him that is my command. Peeps found the mayor in the streets, now trying to direct the fight against the fire. We're already pulling houses down. Can't you see? It's no use. The fire jumps over them. We can't pull them down fast enough. By Sunday night, the wind had changed direction and was blowing the fire north towards the Tower of London. Peeps was worried. His home was near the tower. He'd better start packing. It might burn down too. In the streets, there was chaos. People weren't just frightened. They were angry too. They wanted to find out who had started the fire, wanted to find someone to blame. Soldiers were sent to keep order and help fight the fire. On Monday morning, they formed into crews, commanded by the king's brother, but even they couldn't put it out. The fire was thundering north and west, fanned by the wind, and the flames were so fierce it was hard to get near them. Everyone wanted to leave, and the streets were jammed with horses and carts, carrying people and their belongings to the city gates. Sitting in a cart in his night clothes, Heaps wondered if he'd ever get his things to safety. Ouch! I feel like a potato bouncing about in this cart, but I shouldn't complain. At least I've got a cart to take some of my most valuable things away. Not everyone is so lucky. Many people have to carry theirs, and look... Sick people are even being carried out of their homes still in their beds. Poor people. What will they do now? The people who'd lost their homes and had nowhere else to stay camped in the fields outside the city. They looked back sadly at their homes and wondered what sort of life they would have once the fire had finally been put out. On Tuesday the 4th of September, the fire was at its height. It was a raging inferno, greedily gobbling up everything in its way. Homes, prisons, churches, all were swallowed up in the fire. It seemed nothing could stop it. But there was just one thing left to try. To make the fire breaks more quickly, houses would have to be blown up using gunpowder. Otherwise, people said, the fire would never be put out and the whole city would be destroyed, including the king's palace 
and the Great Tower of London, where huge stores of gunpowder and other ammunition were kept. There's nothing else for it. Give the order. Houses are to be blown up by gunpowder wherever there is no other way of stopping the fire. Very good, Your Majesty. It will be done. So the King's orders were carried out while terrified people watched. Stand back, everyone! Stand back! You don't want to be blown up too, do you? Oh, this is a bit I don't like. Light in the gunpowder. I might blow myself up with it. Right. Here goes. Stand back, I say! It's about to blow! Nervous Londoners wondered what was happening as house after house was blown up. A terrifying series of explosions. Everyone who was able to was expected to join in with the struggle against the fire. Even the king joined in. Send for more gunpowder. The houses in this street will need to be blown up too. Yes, Your Majesty. On the same day, Samuel Pepys started sending some of his family's possessions to friends' homes in case the fire reached his house. And that evening, he decided to dig a hole in the garden, somewhere safe to put some things he especially treasured. Once I've dug this hole, I'll bury my cheese and wine in it. I'm not letting the fire get them. And when the fire is finally out, I'll come back and dig them up. That same night, the fire reached St Paul's Cathedral. Londoners looked on in horror as flames leapt up the wooden scaffolding at the side of the building. Timbers holding up the roof caught fire. Stones exploded from the walls like bullets. And finally, the fire grew so hot that the metal roof itself melted and flowed down the streets like water. The cathedral had stood for over 500 years, but in a few hours, it had gone. Before dawn the next morning, Samuel Pepys was in a hurry to wake his family and leave. Get up! Get up! This is no time for sleeping. The church at the end of the street is on fire. We'll take a boat down the river where you'll all be safe. Later, as they rowed down the river, Pepys watched the city burn. It is like the heavens are on fire. I hope I never see a sight so sad as this again. But by Wednesday night, danger from the fire was almost over. Blowing up houses had finally worked. The fire was dying out. And when Pepys returned to his house, he found it was still standing completely undamaged. And he wrote happily in his diary that all was well again. How lucky I am. The fire has not touched it. But all wasn't well for everyone. Though only a few people are believed to have died in the fire, maybe as many as a 100,000 had been made homeless and were camping in fields outside the city, uncertain when they would ever have homes to return to. Meanwhile, important Londoners were discussing plans for the rebuilding of London. It would cost a fortune, but it had to be done. Everyone agreed that London must never be allowed to burn down again. So this time, it would be built in stone and brick, materials much less likely to catch fire than thatch and timber. Later that year, plans were drawn up by an architect called Christopher Wren. At the heart of the new city would be a new St Paul's Cathedral, the one that stands in the city to this day. And slowly, improvements were made to firefighting, though it would be many years before London or other cities had the protection of the fire service we know today. So when you hear a fire engine racing to an emergency, think how lucky we are today and how very different it was for the people of London in 1666. Well, I would love for you to really learn those two songs really well so that when we see each other next time and I'm going to try and get hold of you so that we can do this online and sing it together and then we're going to make movements on it and I want you to think about especially for Pudding Lane if you can work out a routine that we can do a, a band and down and to the sides something that goes with the music 
okay? And maybe you can send those suggestions, you can sing the song, and you can do the movements, and then I can pick whose movements will work best, and then I can teach it to the other kids, and we can all dance and sing it together. Now, the era or the time that this story happened, happened in 16 what? Who remembers? Ah, yes, 1666. So from what era was it? Was it the classical era or the Baroque era? Yes, from the Baroque era and there was this very important music composer with a surname of Bach B A C H a German composer with a surname of Bach now I'm going to give you a YouTube link and I want you to listen to the Baroque music. It's not the songs that we just learned, it's listening to Baroque music. But I want to ask you to do something for me while you listen to it. We learned about the River Thames in London and we learned about Pudding Lane and the baking of the cakes, right? So either you are going to make me a little sailboat made of recycled material or you're going to bake something that comes from Pudding Lane. But I want to hear the Baroque music in the background while you are baking or while you are making. Send me a little video, even if it's two minutes of your baking or three minutes of you making a little sailboat. You don't have to do both. You can choose which one you want to do for me. Then send that to my WhatsApp so that I can see you are actively listening to what kind of music that we say you're going to listen to? Baroque music. So let's sum up everything that we've learned. The Baroque period is from 1660 to 1750. In 1666 was the Great Fire of London. We learned two songs which I want you to listen to on a daily basis so that next time we get together we can sing it as a group. Okay, then the German composer from the Baroque period or era was Bach, Johann Sebastian Bach. You're going to listen to his music and make me a little sailboat. If you go on YouTube, there are lots of ideas, easy ideas of how to make a little sailboat or you can bake something. And then send me a video of your movement suggestions for the Pudding Lane song. So that next time we can sing the song and I can teach you the movements that go with it. Okay, have fun. I miss you.